It's about the fact, an uncomfortable fact, but it is a fact that we have the technical ability to do this. They are all fast acting, they are cheap, and they are fundamentally imperfect. They're the problems of how you control something where an individual country can have tremendous leverage over the whole planet's climate and where there are winners and losers in ways that, that really could be unpredictable. And I mean, not to frighten you, but I think you can imagine scenarios that lead to war. Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering, that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection. There's all sorts of ways you could do this, uh, but the standard idea has always been you spray sulfuric acid in the stratosphere 20 kilometers over our head and use that to stop the planet warming up. The example many people cite was when uh, the Mount Pinatubo volcano uh, exploded and uh, all of this ash went into the air and had a cooling effect on the Earth. And so people have long proposed since the mid-60s that you could artificially add dust to the stratosphere and cool the planet. Not that this would be a good solution for global warming, it would not. But it does show the way we're steadily developing the powers to manipulate the planet with comparative ease. That sulfur in the lower atmosphere is masking some mm -hmm. of the climate warming from CO2. So is this the global dimming or something? Yeah. Uh, their leading idea is basically to emulate what big volcanoes do, put material in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. So the problem is the following. If you add SO2 to the stratosphere, SO2 doesn't condense. So you might want to put alumina in. Alumina has a very high initial refraction. It's very small. It doesn't coagulate. And you can engineer particles that have particular properties. You can get them out of the stratosphere. You can concentrate particles near the poles. Costs are so cheap that the richest people on the planet could perhaps afford to buy an ice age. It's extraordinarily cheap. I knew it was cheap when I found that they were quoting me in tons. It's also true that particles, as they get bigger, fall out a lot faster. We sort of step back and think, okay, well, how would you actually make particles in the stratosphere? This is really engineering now. But if it was aerosols in the stratosphere, it would likely be put there by airplanes. Start with a fleet of just two or three kind of modified business jets. The basic idea is that if you let a plume off on an aircraft by just changing some little details, you can actually get much smaller particle size distributions by doing this kind of spraying. So there are all sorts of side effects. I'll get to them in a second. But, but if you put sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, for example, you could deplete stratospheric ozone. Smaller size means more surface area, uh, uh, but more surface area means less ozone. Uh, is the stuff in the stratosphere going to be killing some number of people that are going to be a so sort we of just, sacrificed? It, it's, a, it's an <laughs> obvious concern. So if it kills a million people and we're only bad. doing 1% more, we're just killing 10,000 more people. You can do math. Okay. But that's, so, so killing people is not the objective here. <laughs> so if I made a decision or if there was a collective decision to do a geoengineering program, and you put, say, uh, the kind of program I think makes more sense to put about a million tons a year in, but let's say, you might end up killing many tens of thousands of people a year as a direct result of that decision. And so the only thing that we can do to cool the planet or that society can do to cool the planet is deploy these sorts of technologies. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. It's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. It's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And it means there are going to be winners and losers, just like there are winners and losers for CO2, but there are different winners and losers. So this makes the problem, if anything, harder to solve. You've introduced another dimension of complexity into the managing the planet's climate problem. Numerous air quality studies, uh, including from uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters? The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health if they came down into the stratosphere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, uh, in, in particular, uh, small particles and aluminum. We, in our climate model, we looked at how much additional acid rain, acid, acid snow you would get from the sulfur coming out of the stratosphere if you did it at a rate of five megatons per year or 10 megatons per year of sulfate. And it turns out that amount is so much smaller than what humans put in the troposphere on an annual basis by burning fossil fuels as a byproduct. That even in pristine areas, the soil would have a burning capacity and the it wouldn't be harmful. So, so, so the, the collaborators in my working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in the federal pencil paper. 
but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And the answer is no clear cut no. So for the numbers of particles burning the charts here are so tiny compared to the loadings on human health. There are other things that worry me a lot, like the rain on these particles in the upper troposphere when they might affect high clouds. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you're just thinking about the sheer number of particles and the human health impact of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do uh, epidemiological research on human health impacts, and it's not even close to the issue. So 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere will have no human health impacts. So, so let me be more careful here. We're to separate out the toxicological questions. So the aluminum, we've only begun to research and publish nothing. The question I was asking was about purely about particle number density. So what we did is we said, we looked at some global estimates now we have of, 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 of aerosol, global estimates that were built for epidemiological purposes of the global loading of aerosols in terms of health impacts. And we said if we added on top of that what we're doing from the stratospheric aerosols, could it have any impact? And the answer is, that that was totally irrelevant. But that was just on particle number. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at.